uh, many people don't know this, but in 2007, there was a very senior, uh, there was a very um, high level meeting that happened between some of the most senior rabbis in Israel and some of the most senior Hindu spiritual leaders. And it was called the Hindu Jewish Summit. And at the end of it, you know, the very senior Israeli Jewish uh, lead, spiritual leaders understood the issue and they said, you know, we understand the swastika has nothing to do with our um, with our pain and our terminology. Unfortunately, what happened is we, we there were there was no work done to build on that proclamation. And so that proclamation sort of soon got forgotten. But a lot of the work at the highest spiritual leader level has been done. And now what do we need to do with it? Well, that's where organizations like Kona have been playing a major role in helping take this discussion forward and making sure that people in the places that matter uh, know it. Then uh, we were we are also very proud to be a founding partner with the Understanding Swastika uh, Multi-Faith Coalition that was created in 2022. Um, which brought together senior spiritual leaders from the Hindu, Buddhist, Jain and Native American traditions, basically saying, you know, we are now going to work to get take our sacred symbol back and we ask everyone to use the correct terminology. This is a wonderful alliance. I, we, everybody needs to look them up and everybody needs to make sure that their spiritual organizations uh, join and further the work being done by this group. But let's take a look at what's been playing out in the real world in the last two or three years that really made us amplify the uh, swastika education and awareness campaign that we have been running. So in uh, summer of 2020, the state of New York introduced a bill that would have basically outlawed any display of the symbol and it would have trained children to call 911 if they saw that symbol on display. Think about the impact of such a law on our communities, on our mandirs, on our houses, on somebody traveling in a plane uh, with a swastika banner or with a swastika you know, a pendant or whatever. There was no nuance to that law because the lawmaker did not know that there was any alternative meaning to this symbol. Um, there was a there's a university called Brandeis University, which is a Jewish university, and it had just elected an Indian American student uh, president. And this girl said, you know, let me help you guys understand the context why we are opposing this law. For doing that, she got majorly targeted by Jewish activist groups. But she got support from the rabbi of Brandeis University again. So the you know the spiritual leaders have an understanding of what this symbol means to different spiritual groups, and it needs to be taken into the secular realm, which is where folks like us and all the viewers of Sangam talks have a role to play. And legislative change is already underway. So I talked about the New York law. When that New York law start when it was introduced, um, the Hindu community launched and uh, partnered. Uh, that's when we discovered Dr. TK. Nakagaki and other Buddhist leaders, Jain leaders, we all came together and we launched a very aggressive campaign to educate about the meanings of this symbol. We spoke to lawmakers up and down the aisle in New York and ultimately got that bill stopped because they realized what they were about to do. Then that same process got repeated in the state of Maryland and New Jersey, which had also introduced bills to ban the swastika. So you can see that when you speak up for yourself and you talk with reason and logic and facts, you can actually make a difference. And we did this without hurting, you know, we were not uh, trying to hurt any of the groups. We understood that the people who were introducing these laws were coming from a good place because in the 2018 to 2020 era, we had seen a resurgence of uh, white supremacy movements. And very often you will find them using a Hitler symbol and those kinds of crosses and uh, which are again mistakenly called the swastika so in an intent to tackle that hate the lawmakers were just about to ban a symbol that actually impacted the dharmic faiths and uh, then they stopped that which is a way advocacy works um, and i think in the years that follows um, we've actually been like i mentioned stop bills that would have criminalized in three uh, u.s states uh, stopped it in Canada because in Canada a private member bill was also introduced that would have done the same thing and on the flip side we've actually had good laws pass in some of the states so in 2022 the state of California similarly introduced a bill that would have outlawed the swastika 
And then again, we started the same process of engagement with the lawmaker, with the senators and other legislators in California, and we educated them. Now, California was not a complete victory. It was what I call a half victory. Uh, but California did end up passing a law. With the victory part is for the first time, there was a California law that referenced the word Huck and Croys and actually distinguished the fact that, you know, this symbol has multiple meanings. The Huck and Croys is Hitler's symbol and it should be banned. Um, and the display of the swastika by Hindus, Buddhists and Jains was specifically exempted. So, you know, if you live in California, you put up a swastika for Diwali or, you know, whatever, or a monastery or a, and somebody complains, well, you're actually protected by law. Most of us don't know that, but it's important to know that and know that happens. The problem was the California law still kept the word Nazi swastika, which is an oxymoron because as the data shows, Nazis never used the term swastika. So we should really never associate the term swastika with Nazis. The swastika is only a purely auspicious positive term. There is no Nazi swastika because that implies there's a bad swastika, there's a good swastika, as the data shows, there's no such case. There's only one good swastika that is used by dharmic faiths. Um, we, we lost that battle, um, but you know, there's always more battles to fight. And it was good to get Haken Kroy's in uh, to the law at least, and to get and to get the law specifically decriminalize the display of swastika by Hindu, Buddhists, and Jains, and Australia. Uh, two provinces in Australia passed good laws that similarly uh, passed the difference between Haken and Kroy's and swastika. Uh, so I think progress is underway. Like any people's movement, the more people get involved, the more they work, the more they educate, the more they push, the more traction we'll see. Uh, the state of Oregon, unfortunately, again, you always win some, you lose some. Uh, they they changed the name of a place called Swastika, but they also introduced some pretty good uh, teaching materials for their students, uh, which are now starting to teach students at Oregon about this is exactly what we want people to do. We want them to understand the difference between similar looking symbols, their names and their context, because context really matters. Um, we've been talking with Holocaust survivors and uh, Jewish groups as well, and some are on board and some will take longer to come on board. That's okay. Uh, but you know, uh, here's a quote from, uh, you know, a Holocaust survivor, an 85 year old lady um, whose family perished in a major way as Auschwitz. And, uh, you know, she basically said that once she understood the context of uh, the symbol that she thought was the swastika and understanding that Actually, that was a different thing and that the swastika is sacred and beautiful and inspiring to a billion people around the world. That helped her. That helped her in her healing process. And it's, and she said it was a way for her to let go of the past and look at the future. And if uh, people look at our website and our YouTube channel, they'll find a lot of talks we've done with Jewish scholars who understand this, who've talked about uh, this from a Jewish perspective. So, you know, it's baby steps, uh, but we're all on a good track and uh, there's a lot more uh, to go. In terms of engaging with, you know, the question comes up a lot. Why don't you engage with the Jewish community, get their buy-in? And um, I want to just let people know that, yes, we are doing that. Um, and in fact, in uh, many of the, if you look at our website, if you look at our YouTube channel, you will find a lot of commentary, a lot of talks, a lot of discussions uh, with rabbis, with Jewish scholars, Jewish professors. In fact, one of our strongest allies in this fight is a young Jewish scholar called uh, Jeff Kelman, who's done his whole master's thesis on this uh, differentiation of how Hitler's symbol is the Haken Kreuz, not the swastika. And so we are have finding more and more of these allies. In fact, uh, we am very happy to share that just this past week, we had a big breakthrough. Um, there is a gentleman called Steve Heller. He is a kind of like, you know, uh, leading writer, thinker, design intellectual edge, right, uh, on, on this issue. He has authored two books on the swastika as Hitler's symbol. And at one point, um, he used to say that the swastika was an quote unquote irredeemable symbol of evil to basically understanding that it is, there is a Haken Kreuz, there is a swastika. Hitler never used the term swastika. And the swastika is not a hate symbol in so many, so many, so many different contexts. This is actually a huge transition for somebody like him, um, who basically had built a risk, uh, you know, who had built a career on talking about the irredeemable aspects of what he considered Hitler's symbol and now understands as a more nuanced position. But I think it also gives 
it should really encourage everybody who's listening and wondering what they should do with this information because speaking for yourself, making your case, he made the journey. He started on this journey after an interaction with Dr. TK Nakagaki and has come full circle. And this January, he's actually published a very detailed article that I think we can link to and people should read um, talking about this issue in a very nuanced, very sensitive, but very detailed and factual manner. And I think everybody can use his article and take it to their schools, to their colleges, to their offices, and really educate on what is going on. And let me explain why education is needed. For everybody who thinks this is a theoretical issue, uh, during the COVID times when everyone was doing Zoom meetings, one Hindu gentleman actually got a call from HR. Uh, somebody in a Zoom meeting had noticed that he had, you know, a banner, a, a puja, a little um, uh, thing with a swastika on it and reported him to HR as having a hate symbol in his background. Of course, he explained to HR and they were like apologetic and they said they would use it as a learning opportunity. But this kind of stuff can happen. We all live in a very global world and so you know you could be in an airplane and carrying something that somebody you know you really don't want it to be targeted as a hate symbol for carrying a symbol of your faith and not to mention the fact that it's the right thing to do we all need to make sure that we have the freedom of religion to worship the way we believe is sacred and right for us that when our mothers come to visit us they're not targeted for wearing a little swastika pendant or carrying a murti which has these are these are just basic human rights that i think we all need to care about